Hello, my friends. Pastor Wes here. I have a question for you. Have you ever noticed that the colors on the flag for Hamas, the four colors are the same four colors of the four horsemen of the apocalypse in Revelation 6. And there are other things that we need to see that are taking place even right now. Let's talk about it. You know, I think it's amazing that from ancient times, as the Apostle Paul taught us, we can watch Israel and learn from their example. We can be warned and we can actually see the very spiritual warfare that you and I have as believers played out in the life of Israel, even so to this very day. But you know, when these events started taking place on the horrific raid that happened to Israel on October 7th, the Lord began to deal with me that there was much more here for our eyes to see. And I began to see that there was more than the geopolitical and military conflict, and even more than just the events prophesied in Revelation that would be taking place at the end of time. There also was a deeper message. And I want to talk to you about that today. You know, one of the amazing statements of Jesus in Mark 13, verse 16, he told his disciples, you are blessed because you have eyes to see. Eyes to see. And what he was talking about there was not our natural eyes, of course, because everyone has that, or most do. But in this case, he was talking about what Paul meant in Ephesians 1.18, that the eyes of your understanding, or as the original Greek says, that the ophthalmos of your taste guardia, or the eyes of your heart. There is a deeper message, I believe, that's taking place right now in Israel. They're still doing what they've always had to do, fight for, battle for, engaged in warfare, just to maintain the land that God gave them. Now, we're going to do a little metaphorical switch here and see if we can't see as we place an overlay on the events taking place since October 7th, even to this very moment. You see, what's happening there is God has given Israel this land. And yes, it is from the river to the sea, from the river Euphrates all the way to the sea. And yet, there's this carved out section that we call the Gaza Strip, where it seemed to be the best arrangement to allow a certain segment of the so-called Palestinians to have this as a certain area that would be called their state or would be a two-state solution. The only problem with that is that those who are going to occupy that area have avowed in writing and have stated even recently again, that one of their missions is to completely eradicate and eliminate all of Israel. The picture for you and I, if you can make the transfer, is that what land represented in the Old Testament picture of Israel, and still today, represents in a broader sense our lives, the promised land of possessing our complete dedication to Christ in everything we say and do. That should be our pursuit. And yet, oftentimes, we tend to give up part of our land to an enemy committed to destroy us. It's called sin. So let's look at that. The land equals our lives, and God wants us to possess all of our lives. And yet, so often, we let a negotiation start with the enemy to instead of committing to eliminate sin from our lives, we'll have this one little pocket or pet sin that we minimize and somehow feel like maybe we could have a two-state solution here. I can live with that. I don't think that it's only that one little area. And we're going to talk about that today because the parallels are unbelievable. Have you noticed, and I remember when this first happened, I turned to my wife and I said, I see what the enemy is going to do. They want to have hostages so that they can negotiate ongoing ceasefires in hopes that they never have to go back to war. In other words, they make their attack and then they crawl back in their tunnels and then beg for a ceasefire and offer hostages in negotiation for a ceasefire. Write it down, my friends. There's nothing more the enemy wants in his plan. Nothing more that he's trying to succeed at than to get you 
to negotiate with him to just leave at least one sin in your life. You know, that one thing that, well, it, it's something that I'm really kind of fond of and I, I know it's not right, but you know, God cares and he knows my heart. Thank God for grace and on and on it goes. And what we're doing is we're negotiating an enemy's request for a ceasefire. And one of the reasons they're able to do that is because they've taken hostages, people that we love. Have you ever thought about that? They're using their own families as shields. And oftentimes the enemy will do that. When you feel that you have a right and perhaps a responsibility to respond to a loved one, when they ask you, mom, is, is this kind of a lifestyle all right? Can I do this? Everybody's doing it. And you know what the Bible says, but you're afraid because you don't want to lose a hostage. You don't want someone you love to be hurt. And so you negotiate and think, well, I don't have to say anything about that. We'll let that go. And we'll do it for those we love and we certainly can do it for ourselves. And isn't it interesting that the enemy will back off at times? He's also in tunnels underground. This is a different level, a different paradigm level of warfare. It's spiritual warfare. The enemy wants to pop out and attack when you least expect it. So my friends, whether it's in the political realm over there in Israel today, but more importantly, even in our spiritual lives, we can never negotiate with the enemy over sin. Hamas has got to go. And yet their plan is, well, we're going to negotiate with you. They, they call it a ceasefire, but their intention is never to ever be defeated. They want to stay in this so-called two-state solution. And if you and I look at that carefully, we have to be honest with ourselves. That's what the Apostle Paul said in his letter to the Church of Corinth. He said, there comes times when we should stop and examine ourselves and see if we're in the faith. Or have we negotiated and allowed the enemy to deceive us into thinking as long as we leave certain areas of defeat in our lives, we can still live in this two-state solution. But it can't work. Hamas must go. And God is committed that he wants us to surrender all and to give everything to him, to love him, love him with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, and our body without any Gaza Strip that we have negotiated with the enemy that's okay to stay. Now, what do we do with that thing? Let's, let's be very honest here. I've often thought about the scripture in Hebrews chapter 12, verse one, where he said, let us lay aside every weight and the sin, the singular sin that doth so easily beset us. Now, that word beset, the original Greek is a very interesting word. It literally means to block by surrounding. You're trapped, you're blocked. And so the imagery here is of someone who's trying to run a race and yet there's a barrier, a, a, a blockade in front of them that besets them. In this case, he calls it a singular sin that would beset us from the race. That word be said again means you can't go forward. You can't, you can't go on with God. Things that you know that he wants to do in your life and maybe in the lives of those you love. And yet there seems to be this mountain that is a barrier that needs to move. You know, as I have contemplated that, I realized that I've seen the enemy do the same thing in my own life where there might be that one thing and it's like, well, my goodness, everything else I've got together and... Uh, that can't be that big a deal, but let me, let me just tell you from personal testimony. If you leave even one terrorist, my friends, they grow. It will grow. Sin is like a cancer. The Bible tells us that. It's, it's like a leprous cancer that will continue to eat away until that which begins to disfigure will eventually destroy. Hamas, all sin, has got to go. There's got to be a commitment to it. That's why the verse says, lay it aside. Now, how do you do that? Have had that question asked through the decades of counseling I've done. And I remember a number of years ago when I was contemplating this and I thought, it is amazing how many times I've heard in counseling someone say, Brother West, I had a struggle with this years ago and I thought I finally had victory over it and it wasn't gonna bother me anymore. But then all of a sudden it just popped up kind of like a terrorist out of a tunnel. And all of a sudden a rocket was fired right into the middle of my life and my family and things were a mess. And I thought I had victory over that. But then here came that besetting sin, singular. 
And I know the enemy will tell you, say, well, it's just that one thing. There are people that have got many problems in their lives. Why would you worry over that one besetting sin? Well, among other things, you could ask Achan that, who kept something from Jericho, and it ended up being costing the lives of him and his family because he kept one thing. That one sin was enough to cause defeat throughout the entire camp of Israel. And many times there'll be just one thing in your life that you know you haven't got victory over yet. And it comes to your mind every time you try to pray. Why would you think of witnessing? Because you think, who am I to be telling anybody about Jesus when I struggle with this one thing? And so the enemy can take just one thing. It just took one giant howling at the troops of Israel day after day, mocking them. But that one thing prevented them from moving forward in victory. And so it is in our lives, my friends. It only takes one thing for the enemy to bring condemnation, to bring guilt into your life, to bring a barrier or a mountain between you and the Lord. I remember after a counseling session many years ago, I began to really pray about why I kept seeing this phenomena, if you will, of people saying that, you know, I thought I had victory over that, but then it just popped up again. I think of men who told me that I used to struggle with pornography, and Brother Wes, I never thought I would ever have a problem with it again. Then I found myself, I was out of town, you know, I was in the hotel, I knew it was on TV, but I, I didn't plan to turn it on. And yet there came that one besetting sin and guilt follows, condemnation follows, and it becomes a barrier of separation. Or as Isaiah said, our sins have separated us between us and God. Fellowship has been broken. Guilt now takes the place of sweet peace between you and your savior. What do we do about that? As I say, as I was praying about it, the Lord spoke a verse to me that at first I thought, well, I don't know that that explains anything different than what I've already understood because I've always told people when they say, Brother Wes, what do I do? I don't struggle with anything else but this one besetting sin. Of course, I would tell him to put your faith in the cross, continue to trust God. And yet I knew there was something else the Lord wanted to show me about this, a secret, if you will. And I believe he did, and I want to share that with you. He spoke the verse in Matthew chapter 11, verse 23, where Jesus told his disciples, he said, you can say to this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the midst of the sea. And I thought to myself, well, I've heard a lot of teaching on that. I've done my share of it. And I see there's more than just this thing about words and the power of your words. There's an application there, but I think we've distorted it and taken it into even false doctrine. But Jesus did say that there's something we can say to a mountain, a barrier, an addiction, that one sin that blocks the progress that you want to make with the Lord in your own life. And he said, you can say something to it that'll make it be cast into the sea. So I'm gonna ask you a question. It's kind of what the Lord did with me. What do you say to your mountain? Now just picture your mountain and don't tell me you don't have one because everyone does. It may be an anger that, well, I don't, I'm not angry all the time, but given the right circumstances, here comes that terrorist popping his head out of the tunnel and he's gonna fire a rocket right into your relationship with your family, your loved ones, when you didn't expect it. And here's that mountain again. What do you say to your mountain? Well, first of all, let me ask you a question. What do you call your mountain? Let's just, let's call it addiction 101. You fill in the blank. It can be cake, uh, cake or cocaine. Whatever it is that you just can't get victory over, Jesus said there's something you could say to it. Well, first of all, are you saying the wrong thing? What do you call your mountain? Is that addiction a friend or a foe? Let me ask you that again. What do you call your addiction? I mean, in your heart of hearts, would you define it as something that is an enemy that you hate? Or is it a friend that you kind of treat like a a pet puppy? You know, there's pets can be a problem, but we love our pets until they start chewing up the furniture in our lives. And then suddenly we want to get rid of the pet. And that may be where you are today. Maybe your mountain is no longer a friend. You see, Jesus promised he would deliver us from our enemies. He never said anything about delivering us from what you call a friend. Because you'll find excuses to keep them in your life, to keep that mountain in your life, and then you'll blame other people for it. 
You know, I'm reminded of the story of Abraham. You find that Abraham, who's called of God, I mean, we, we call him the father of faith. And he was leaving a, an area of, of famine that they had in the land and went down to Egypt. God didn't tell him to, but he did, looking for help, trying to work things out. And when he got down there, he was fearful that his beautiful wife, who at that time would have been about Sarah, would have been around 65. And apparently from what scripture says, she was very attractive. And it was very common for kings in the land when someone came through the land, if they saw a wife that they were attracted to, hey, I'm the king, kill the husband, bring her to me, let her join my harem. And so Abraham, knowing this, was greatly fearful. And so he actually plots out an agreement with his wife, Sarah, and he said, listen, when we go down to Egypt because of this concern, just tell everybody I'm your brother. And actually that would have been a half lie because Sarah was half sister to Abraham, same father, something very common back then. And so as we often can do, we say, well, that's not a complete lie. I can say, and you should say, Sarah, just tell them I'm your brother. And that way I won't get killed. Well, sure enough, that's what they do. But the problem is she was so attractive and Pharaoh in Egypt saw her and he decided he wanted her. And especially when he found out, well, she's single anyway. That's not her husband, that's her brother, Abraham. Well, if you know the story, you know that uh, Pharaoh almost got into a lot of trouble with that. And so the truth finally comes out and it could have cost Abraham his life. More importantly, we may have lost the lineage that Jesus was to come through. And so you can see where one thing can actually, could have prevented the entire plan of redemption, something that seems so small. But here's the point that often is missed. Do you realize 20 years later, listen, 20 years later, Abraham does the same thing again. This time he finds himself within the realm of King Abimelech, a Canaanite king. And he makes the same plan because he's also fearful. Hey, I, if they know I'm your husband, you're still attractive. And at that point, some say, well, how attractive could she be? Because she would have been around 100 years old. Again, they lived a bit healthier than we do back then. But more importantly, if you understand that one of the things that they would do is often join someone to a king's harem for prestige, political power. And so if you were traveling as Abraham would have been with a large entourage of people, uh, you're never going to be an enemy in my kingdom because I've got one of your sisters in my harem. So either way, the lie pops up again out of the tunnel. Here comes that old fear of Abraham again, his old nature of trying to figure out a way, which wasn't God's way. He decides, I've got a better idea. Let's lie. Let's just tell him you're my sister and everything will be fine. Well, it almost happened again. Abraham could have been killed. Sarah could have uh, lost uh, her life as well. Once the truth was found out, we certainly would have lost the, again, the opportunity for Christ to come through that pure line. And yet that one thing that Abraham should have had victory over 20 years. Do you realize if you go back just a couple chapters, he's having one of the most awesome experiences in chapter 15 with God. God actually calls him and calls him a prophet. Do you know he even told Abimelech, he warned him. He said, listen, the woman you've taken, she's married to a prophet. Be careful. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't know if you'd want to brag on Abraham being a prophet right about then because he just lied to the man, almost got him killed. He could have had the curse of God brought on him because God sent a plague on Pharaoh for doing it. And yet at the last minute, God warns Abimelech. And so he goes to Abraham and said, what are you doing to me? And do you know Abraham even had excuses? Two major excuses. He said, first of all, he said, well, here's the problem. He said, I knew that there was no godliness in this land. Actually, he called it the fear of God. He said, in other words, I knew that because of the kind of place you got going on here and the crime and the lawlessness, I could have really been killed so somebody could have my wife. And he said, and then on top of that, listen to this. And you'll find this in Genesis chapter 20. I think it's long about verse 18. Abraham says, and the other thing is that God had set me out to wander through the land. And if you look up that word Hebrew, in Hebrew, wander, now remember, he said, God sent me out to wander. God called him to a land that he hadn't found yet. But when Abraham describes what God had sent him to do to find this promised land, 
He said, God caused me to wander. Now there's six words in the Hebrew for wander. Most of them are benign. They mean, hey, I'm just taking a little wander down to the lake or we wandered a little bit off path. But this one word that's used there actually means I was pushed into a land where I got lost. I was pushed into a wilderness. It's a very negative, strong word. And yet he's accusing God as he tells Abimelech. He said, listen, the reason I lied was because, well, you see, uh, God just sent us out in this wilderness. I didn't know what to do. I'm trying to survive. And all of a sudden negotiating with himself so that he can excuse away what he did 20 years ago. And now here he is doing the same thing again. And that's the cry I kept hearing from so many people. Why this one thing that I thought I had victory over? Struggled and then had victory. And now that terrorist has come back again. Oh, my friends, it's never worked for natural Israel. It'll never work for all of us as believers. You cannot negotiate a two-state solution and justify and allow and call a friend sin and expect that God's grace just covers that and there'll be no destruction. It's never worked for Israel. How many treaties they've signed and land they've given and provision they've made and treaties that were agreed upon only to come back and find out that Hamas is committed to destroy. By whatever name it goes, my friends, evil today and sin has the same impact. And just like Abraham, you may see nothing but peace and calm for a while. And then they come climbing out of the tunnels and there's that besetting sin again. What do we do about it? Well, again, that scripture, he spoke to my spirit, say to the mountain. And again, the question, what do you say to that mountain? Let me tell you what you don't say because I've tried it and it doesn't work. You can't say I'm going to pray and fast more and that's going to take care of you. I tried that, it doesn't work. You can't say, well, if I just ignore you and just don't pay any attention to it, no, it's still there. It'll still come back to terrorize you again. What do you say to that mountain? As I was praying about that, the Lord began to remind me that in Zechariah, and you'll find this in Zechariah chapter four, verse seven, that there is a scene that takes place where Israel has come back to Jerusalem after the Babylonian captivity. Unfortunately, the temple has been destroyed. It's a pile, a mountain, the Bible calls it, of rubble. And in Zechariah chapter four, we're told And God speaks to Zerubbabel, who's now in charge of rebuilding this temple. Think about it now. He's staring at a mountain of their past failure. The temple was destroyed, God told him, because they refused to repent and come back to him. They had all their excuses for allowing terrorists to live in a two-state situation in their lives. And God said it won't work. And after warning with prophets again and again, finally God said judgment is coming. The temple was destroyed. They were taken into captivity. 70 years later, God releases them. They come back, but they look at their past failures. The pile of rocks and stones that used to be a temple. It's a mountain now of memory of where they fail God. But then God says, this is what you do. Say to that, listen, say to that mountain, what mountain? Your mountain of failure, say to that barrier, that's keeping you from moving on with God. Listen, I've struggled with you and failed and I'm giving up because I've learned that I'm crucified with Christ yet nevertheless I live. But I live now by the faith of the Son of God, not by my faith, by his faith, what he did on the cross, not what I can do to prove my worthiness of his holiness. I have sinned like we all have and come short of the glory of God. All we like sheep have gone astray. You see, Jesus didn't come to give us some kind of a reformation plan or a a way that we can improve our moral standards. He actually came to die for us and then told us to pick up our cross daily, die and follow him. You see, he wants our natural man to stay crucified so that the life of Christ can be lived through us. I've tried works, I've tried long fasts, I've tried these things, but sometimes there's that one thing that just won't move. I'm convinced personally, listen carefully, that sometimes God will leave something in your life that in your natural ability, you can't get victory over. I've counseled too many people that afterwards, I'm looking back, I I tremble wondering, were they really even saved? 
because their idea was check the box to go to heaven. Yeah, I saved that simple little prayer at the altar. I shook the preacher's hand and I tried to come back to church occasionally, but there was no change in the life. The tunnels were still there and, the, and that sin would still pop up, but yet they could have natural ability, certain natural self-control to where they looked at their lives and said, overall, it looks pretty good. But you know, God will leave something in your life that you can't have victory over because of your sin nature. Maybe because of your lifestyle and the way you were raised and your particular environment. Yeah, you don't rob banks. You, you don't uh, hijack cars and, and, and do some of these bizarre things. And so you feel pretty good about yourself, except for that one besetting sin, which is God's way of reminding you like he did the apostle Paul who said, I have this thorn in my flesh and I've asked God three times, take it away. We don't know what it is, but whatever that mountain was, it would move. It was going to take something more than even the Apostle Paul's greatest ability because God went on to tell him, but my grace is sufficient for you. Amen. In Zechariah chapter four, God told Zerubbabel, he said, you say to that mountain, your failure that keeps popping back up in your life, you shout at it, grace, grace. Oh, listen to it again. Shout at your failure. Shout at that mountain. Grace, grace. Don't shout at it of what you're going to do and how you're going to try harder and you're going to make a New Year's resolution and, and you're, going to, you're going to give more to the missions. You can do a lot of good things. But my friends, there's some things in our lives that only God can take care of. And that's why we shout grace. When the enemy comes and says, what about that one thing in your life? You know what I shout back at him? I say, God's grace is sufficient for me. Oh, I, I don't want it to stay. I'm not making a deal with it. I don't call it a friend and I'm not going to make it a pet. But as I pursue it, I'm going to shout at it. God's grace is going to take care of you. I'm committed. You've got to go. I'm not going to make a treaty with you. You're not going to stay in the Gaza Strip, sin. I'm blowing up all the tunnels, exposing you for what you are. I've gone into God's word and I've seen not only what sin is called in my life, but I also see what God said he did to take care of it. For God so loved the world, he gave his son for that reason. Not just to forgive us, but to cleanse us. Not just to forgive us of sin, to break the power of sin. And sometimes, my friends, that thing in your life, listen carefully, you're going to have to shout at it more than once. Do you remember the tense of the Greek verbs there when Jesus said, Ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you? The Greek tense there is throughout all of Jesus' teaching. Ask and keep asking. Seek and keep seeking. Knock and keep knocking until it opens. Keep saying to that mountain, no matter how many times it mocks you, I'm getting back up and I am not quitting because it's not my strength anyway. God's gonna take care of you in time. And that's why grace is repeated there. You keep having to shout at it, grace. You keep knocking until it's gone. You see what happens to many of us, and I've heard it, Pastor Wes, I've tried. Well, then my question would be, well, how'd you try? Well, I remember I went, remember I came to the altar, you prayed for me, and I, I went home and I, I prayed the next morning, and then that night I was right back in the same mess. And then, what do you mean, and then? I said, well, what'd you do then? Well, I, I, I quit, it doesn't work. My friends, the scripture says, ask and keep asking. If it's really important to you, and you know how important it is to God, then it doesn't matter how long it takes, how many ceasefires that the enemy wants, we're coming after it until it's gone. We're gonna blow up every tunnel. We're gonna take down every stronghold that the enemy has because we've tried this before. We tried to give you a place in our lives and you still wanna destroy us. So guess what? I'm not telling you what I'm gonna do because I've tried and it doesn't work but I'm gonna tell you what Jesus has already done. He died for my sin. He broke the power of that sin. I don't know when it's gonna be removed, but I'm gonna keep telling you the same thing. And when you come back and remind me again of how I failed God, I'll remind you again how Jesus pleased God and how I put my faith in what he did for me on the cross of Calvary. Oh, that we would have eyes to see. I think of Ephesians chapter one, where Paul said, Oh, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened, that you would see what is the hope of your calling. What is the depth and riches of that inheritance that he's placed within you? Do you realize you have an inheritance? 
You don't pay for an inheritance. You can't earn an inheritance. You get it because someone you love died and left it for you. My friends, Jesus loves you. And he died to prove it. And he's left you an inheritance. He was the firstborn of many brethren. And now Romans 8 tells us we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Oh, that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened to see that hope of that inheritance he has in you. Believe that every time the enemy mocks you and tries to remind you of your past, you tell him what the Apostle Paul said, I'm forgetting those things which are behind and I'm gonna press forward to the mark of the prize of the high calling that's in Christ Jesus. I'm gonna shout at that mountain every time it tries to mock me. Grace, grace, I'm only here because of God's amazing grace. Oh, my friends, I pray today you will see what Christ has done for you on the cross, that you'll have a deeper understanding of his love. Oh, that we would have eyes to see. Heavenly Father, I pray for those today that are honest enough as we examine our lives and say, why that one thing that may have come from generations back and that is not just going to go overnight, but we've signed up for the full fight and we're not going to quit and negotiate a ceasefire and stop fighting against this. We're going to stand our ground and keep shouting, grace, grace, Jesus paid it all. Hallelujah. And my friends, I pray today that your heart will be open to what God can do in your life. Be patient with him. He's being patient with you. You will have victory one day. If you never give up, he won't give up on you. His love is that great. And I pray today that you'll have eyes to see in Jesus' name, God bless.